how are you today? Happy Valentine's Day. I was just at the grocery store and everyone in line was buying flowers. I guess they have a Valentine to bring home to. It was very sweet to see. So we are going to read some more of Jacqueline Suzanne's Valley of the Dolls. It is getting hot and heated up. It is just so saucy. Here is an update on a previous shout out or um, is that don't buy it. It it didn't work. I mean, I still have that split there in my cuticle. It, it just didn't deliver like the commercial. I'm still using chapstick on it. Chapstick or lip balm it seems to be the only thing. So just don't don't waste your money. I mean, it was six and a half dollars. I should have thought it would have worked a lot better than it for that much. I mean, this is this would have been worth it for a dollar, not for six and a half. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. And this is my I bought this day at Lidl. It's almost forty dollars, but it is a nice. It's it's kind of heavy, so I'm not going to lift it up, but it's. It's pretty nice. It's it holds everything. I needed something that would hide all the little props for YouTube that I made, and that seems to, it helps a lot. I've, I've already assembled it. It only took about a minute, and I moved into it, and it seems to hold just about everything. And it's very inconspicuous, being gray and just sort of a padded box, so it won't stand out. And this is this you can't believe it. I. It's in full bloom. There's only three more buds that need to bloom out. <laughs> don't ask me how. I don't usually keep plants alive, but hey, we'll just go with it. Let's just dig right into Jacqueline Suzanne. Valley of the Dolls. We're up to page 129. The party was going strong when they arrived, but at Helen's entrance, all activity stopped and everyone turned toward the door. There was a split second of silence that exploded into a frenzy ovation. Helen acknowledged it with a smile and a good-natured wave that commanded the party to return to the festivities at hand. The show's press agent leapt forward to guide her to the local press and some of the important backers. Leon led Anne to a quiet corner and brought her a ginger ale and a plate of listless dry chicken sandwiches. There's hot food across the room, he said as he settled beside her. I'll have to get at it after the crowd clears a bit. I'm not really hungry, Anne insisted as she nibbled at one of the tasteless sandwiches. Her eyes roved around the room. I don't see Neely. I'm afraid only the principals are invited to this party. The chorus and showgirls have their own shindig. Why, that's awful. Not really. They take up a collection among themselves, get much better sandwiches at the delicatessen, hole up in someone's room, and have a perfectly marvelous time knocking the higher-ups. Another hush suddenly enveloped the room. Anne's eyes automatically swung to the door. Jim Taylor, a leading columnist in New Haven, had just entered with Jennifer North. Each time she saw Jennifer, the girl's incredible beauty came as a fresh surprise. She watched the backers swarm over for an introduction, and once again, she was doubly surprised at Jennifer's warmth, her easy interest in everyone she met. Helen ambled over and pulled up a chair. You two are smart, sneaking off in a corner like this. God, how I hate these parties. But it's Gilbert's way of paying off the backers. Gives them one night to mingle with showbiz. She punctuated the last words with a grin. Gil Case joined them. There's a wonderful chicken a la king over there. Chinese food, too. Gil, why do you always serve such shit at these parties, Helen asked. It's good food. The hotel recommended it. I'm sure they also recommended roast beef, but that's too expensive. Now, Helen, Gil said pleasantly, this is your night. Enjoy it. He disappeared into the milling crowd. Hey, Gil, Helen shrieked. We got a little talking to do. She leapt from her chair and followed him. He wasn't, he hasn't a chance, said Leon, smiling. Do you think she'll keep at it about Terry King? I mean, Anne asked. She won't relent, not an inch. Maybe I should talk to Helen, Anne said thoughtfully. 
Terry King is good. She deserves a chance, and she's no competition to Helen. I'm sure I could convince her. Anne, don't try. You'll have your head snapped off. No, Leanne, we're friends. That's the trouble. No one treats Helen like a human being. She's easy to talk to. I know she's, she's, she'd listen to me. He took her hand and looked into her eyes. I believe you mean it, Anne. Wonderful, Anne. How did anyone as lovely as you get into such a rat race? You only think you know, Helen. Underneath the grease paint, there's cast iron. You're wrong, Leon. I do know, Helen. I talk to her at night late for hours when the mask is off and she speaks from the heart. She's a wonderful woman. The toughness is all put on. No one takes the trouble to dig beneath it. He shook his head. I'll go along with this sweet side exists, but it isn't Helen. It's perhaps, perhaps one of the small sides of Helen, one that is rarely shown and one that is capable of dissolving at a moment's notice. But the toughness, that is always there. Oh, Leon. Suddenly there was a surge to the door. A bellhop entered, his arms burdened with advanced copies of the morning paper. Helen grabbed a set and scanned the notices quickly. Gil Case read them aloud. The show was an unqualified hit. The critics praised the music, raved about the book, and riotously claimed Helen. She was a living legend, the greatest musical comedy star alive, an accomplished actress, and, and on and on and on. Terry King also received a few nice mentions, and Jennifer Norris was rewarded with a superlative on her physical attributes. Everyone congratulated everyone. Backers walked around with silly smiles, shaking hands and crowding Helen with praise. This is a marvelous spot for us to make an exit, Leanne suggested. They had just reached the door when Henry, hey, how are you, Connor Hart? Good to see you. When Henry blocked the way. Okay, have a good night. Going somewhere, he asked nonchalantly. Thought we'd go across to the diner and get some decent food, Leon answered. Oh, no, my boy, you don't leave me alone with this. With what? Leon asked innocently. The show's home, surely. Only Helen insists on an immediate meeting with Gilbert when, in ten minutes, in Gil's suite, and I need you, if for nothing more than just moral support, Anne covered her disappointment with a smile. Go on, Leon. It is late. I'm not really hungry. Not on your life, he said as he tucked her arm in his. You know the real Helen. Perhaps you can dig her up for us tonight. We'll need all the help we can get. The atmosphere in Gil Case's suite offered a violent contrast to the festivities of the party. Helen sat on a couch, sipping at a glass of champagne, sulking with the unflattering childish pout. The stage makeup had caked and run, emphasizing the wrinkles and forming unattractive little cracks on her face. This is complete madness, Gil Case threw his arms around to the ceiling in despair. Here we are, all sitting around as if at a wake, and we've got the biggest hit of the season going for us. You bet your ass it's a hit, Helen snarled. Every show I do is a hit. It's going to make you a rich man, Gil. You'll be a big picture sale, and I'll sit back and watch Betty Grable and Rita Hayworth do my part. Okay, that's the game. But I don't have to sit back and watch a little whore like Terry Ginn get a Hollywood ticket through my efforts. Helen, she barely got a mention. Oh, yeah? Uh, one paper said she was a cinch for pictures. She's also got the best song in the show. Henry spoke up. Helen, we've gone over that. There's no way that song can be written, rewritten for your role. The boys sat up at two nights trying to lick it. It's an ingenue song. And... They also said Jennifer Norris was a cinch for pictures, Gil added. Jennifer Norris doesn't, Jennifer North doesn't sing. Helen, Terry King, can't hurt you, Henry pleaded. You bet your ass she can't because it isn't going to get the chance. This is my show and I'm not Santa Claus. The only star that comes out of a Lawson show is Lawson. But the girl is good, Gil insisted. The two songs she does helps the show. And what's good for the show is good for you. As you said, it's your show. Well, if she's so good, go star her in her next show. How much money would your backers come up with her? Come up with for her? Helen stood up. Helen, you're too big for this. 
This girl can't hurt you, and she deserves a chance. You had to start, too. Remember your first show? Suppose Nancy saw Shaw had insisted you get the boot in New Haven. Where would you be today? Where in hell is Nancy Shaw today? Helen snapped. Listen, Henry, she was pushing 40 when I came along. If she'd been smart, she'd have gotten rid of me. But she was stuck up. She was a beauty, and all those great beauties are stuck up. She figured I was no competition in the looks department. Maybe I wasn't, but I managed to walk off with the show. Not, with, not that this could happen to Terry King. She's no Helen Lawson. When you get down to it, Nancy Shaw was no Helen Lawson either. But I learned from her mistake. No one uses me or my show to feather their own little nest. Gil shrugged. She's got a run of the play contract. Helen's smile was na nasty. I know all about the run of the play contracts. But Helen, she received decent notices. I can't go to my backers and say I have to pay her off because she's no good. I agree, said Helen. Helen said amiably. And it wouldn't do you any good in the business to have it known she was fired. Right. Helen agreed. That's the last thing we both want. At least you're settled on that, her eyes narrowed. Now go to it. Get rid of her the sensible way. You can do it. You've done it before. Gil Case seemed to shrink. Three inches in size. Then with a heavy sigh, he said, all right, but I'd better wait until after the Philadelphia opening. Oh, no, you don't, Helen bellowed, and let her get another set of notices. I want her out of this this weekend. Gil lost some of his patience. My dear girl, then what? Who replaces her Monday for Philadelphia opening? Send for Penny Maxwell. She, she auditioned for the part. She's a quick study. Besides, I wanted her in the first place. You're rehearsing for Max Seller's new show. You're kidding. Christ, she sings sharp and she's a pig. Then it's settled, Gil said. Terry opens in Philadelphia. She has to. Even if I get on the phone tomorrow with every agent in New York, there's no one who can get up in the part, get up in that part in time. I know someone who could, Anne said suddenly. Everyone turned and stared at her. I know it's none of my business, she added nervously. Who do you know, Angel? Helen asked kindly. Neely O'Hare. She's, Terry under, she's Terry's understudy. She knows every song, and she really sings quite well. Out of the question, Gil said haughtily. I put her in on a, as an understudy only to cover us on the road. I intend to get a real understudy when we hit New York. She's too insignificant. Reminds me of Orphan Annie. Helen's eyes narrowed. And what should an ingenue look like? A fucked out redhead with big tits? Helen, it's a good part. I can't take a chance for Philadelphia opening with an unknown kid. She's been in Vaudeville her whole life, Anne offered. She's used to audiences. Really, Mr. Case, Neely might be wonderful. He hesitated. Well, we could try her, I suppose. I'd have three weeks in Philly to find someone else if she doesn't work out. Helen stood up. Then everything is settled. We can all go to sleep. Like, like little lambs, Gil said angrily, except I'm the one who is to handle Terry King. I'll bet you did plenty of that before you signed her, Helen snapped. She walked to the door. Call a rehearsal for everyone at 11 tomorrow, except me. Start the ball rolling. I gotta get some sleep. We got a matinee yet? She turned to Anne. But Gudge came tonight, Annie Pie. I'll check in with you when I get in bed. Gil closed the door after Helen. You boys weren't any help, he said accusingly. I tried. Henry hunched his shoulders, but I knew it was useless. He looked at Leon and Anne. Go on, have your eggs. I'll stay with Gil and map out the slaughter. As they rang for the elevator, Leanne said, Shall we try the little beanery across the street? I'm not hungry. Tired? Not, not a bit. Her eyes were shining. I think I could stand some hair, air. How about it? Want to break the winter in New Haven? They walked down the deserted street. What will they do about Terry King? Anne asked. Force her to quit. Leanne's breath smoked the darkness. But how? Come to rehearsal tomorrow if you have a strong stomach. She shivered. Well, at least Neely will get a chance. Hi. Hi there, big boy. Good to see you. Ahoy. Well, at least Neely will get a chance. You are wonderful. I'd like a friend like you. She looked at him suddenly. Leon, what do you think I am? Do you suppose I'm walking with you on a cold December night just because I enjoy freezing? I'm walking because I am a friend, Anne. I'm also a realist. New Haven will end. But you have a great clump of diamond on your finger and a nice guy that goes with it. You're much too nice for a quick out-of-town romance. Is that all it would be? Could it be anything more? 
He stopped and looked down at her. It can be anything you want, Leon. Without a word, he spun her around and led her back to the hotel. They didn't speak until they entered his room. It was a duplicate of the colorless old-fashioned room that had been assigned to her. Leon took her coat. For a moment, he stared at her tenderly. Then he held out his arms. She rushed to him to his lips, cold for the night air, but firm and demanding as they met her own. Her arms slid around him. She was surprised at the urgency with which she returned his kiss as if she had always been waiting to kiss like this. She clung to him, her mind spinning deeper and deeper into the wonder of that kiss. When she broke away, she looked at him with tears in her eyes. Oh, Leon, thank you for making me believe. Believe? I, I can't explain. Just hold me. She threw her arms around him. He kissed her again. She prayed it would never stop. Her whole body trembled with the pure joy of his touch. Suddenly, he broke away. He held her at arm's length. His voice was hoarse but gentle. And I want you very much, but you must make the decision. He looked down at her ring. You can make this mean whatever you wish, but if it does turn out to be um, just for New Haven, I would understand. Leon, I don't want it to be an out-of-town romance. Sit down, Anne. He led her to a gent gently to the edge of the bed. If I thought you did, I would never have brought it up. And if I wanted a girl just for the weekend, there's a large cast to choose from. I wouldn't have to go after one who was taken. There's a strange hysteria connected with a New Haven opening. Tonight will pass and Monday will come. You'll look back in New, ha New York on Monday. It will be another world. And this whole weekend may seem unreal. I want you to know if that happened, I would understand. And what about you, she asked. Could this be hysteria for you too? He laughed. Oh dear God, Anne. Do you know how many New Havens, Philadelphias, and Bostons I've been through? This is just another night with one wonderful exception. You're here. She reached down and touched his face with her fingertips. I love you, Leon. I wouldn't hold you to that. I don't. Don't you believe me? I think you mean it. This moment, I don't think you're a girl who goes to bed with a man unless she believes it's love. I've never said that to anyone, Leon. I do love you. He stood up and lit a cigarette. When he turned around, his face was set. I'm going to send you back to your room. He walked over and picked up her coat. She sat on the bed. Leon, I don't understand. This can wait. See how you feel about it on Monday in New York. I'll still feel the same. I can take that chance. I can't take that chance. She got up slowly. You really want me to leave? Her vision was growing misty. Good God, Anne. It's the best. It's the last thing I want. But for your sake, I, Leon, I want to stay, she said almost humbly. He looked at her curiously as if measuring the meaning of her words. Then suddenly he flashed one of his quick smiles and tossed off his jacket. He crossed the room and held out his arms. Come here, you beautiful golden wench. I tried being noble, but you've ripped away my last shred of resistance. She felt her lips twitch as she tried to match his smile. He hugged her lightly and released her. Now what? He was taking off his tie. What was she supposed to do? She truly wanted to go to bed with him, but there must be a certain etiquette involved. She couldn't start pulling off her clothes like a burlesque queen. Oh, Lord, why hadn't she worn her new slip? And why hadn't she asked someone... How, someone how one went about this. Now he was taking off his shirt. She had she had to do something. She couldn't just stand there. He unbuckled his belt and nonchalantly pull, pointed toward the bathroom. Want an undressing room? She nodded dumbly and rushed in. Safely behind the closed door, she undressed. Now what? She couldn't just stalk into the bedroom naked. Hey, how are you, baby world? Good to see you. Now what? She couldn't just stalk into the bedroom naked. She had dreamed of just such a moment of giving herself to a man she loved, but not like this, not in a small hotel room in New Haven in her daydreams. She had envisioned a lush double bed, had pictured herself floating in a white gossamer nightgown into her husband's arms. The lights would be dim and she'd glide ethereally under the sheets and into the tender arms of her lover. Her dream had never gone beyond that and never progressed to the actual act of making love. She had only dreamed of the emotion in the romantic setting and her lover had been a vague faceless man. Now he had a face. She had no gossamer gown. She was standing naked and shivering under the harsh bathroom light and she didn't know what to do. Hey there, it's awfully lonesome out here, Leon called. She looked around frantically and grabbed a large bath towel. 
She draped it around her and timidly opened the door. Leon was in bed with the sheet up to his waist. He squashed out the cigarette he was smoking and held out his arm. She turned to grope for the light switch in the bathroom. Leave it on, he said. I want to see you, to believe it's really you in my arms. She approached the bed and he took her hands. The towel dropped to the floor. My lovely Anne, she said softly. He said softly. His admiration in the natural easy way he appraised her body dissolved her embarrassment. He tossed aside the sheet and threw her into his arms. The strength of his body against her own suddenly seemed the most natural feeling in the world, like the impossible and delirious new sensation of feeling his mouth on hers, kissing her deeply, searchingly. She felt herself responding to his embrace with an ardor she had never dreamed she possessed, her mouth demanding more and more. She couldn't kiss him deeply enough. His hands caressed her body gently, then intimately, yet her emotional excitement dominated all physical sensation. To have him in her arms, to be close, to feel free, kiss his eyelids, his brow, his lips, to know what he wanted her, then he cared. And then it was happening. Oh God, this was the moment she wanted to please him, but the pain caught her unaware and she cried out. He pulled away immediately and released her. And she could see the surprise in his eyes. Go on, Leon, she begged. It'll be all right. He lay back with a groan. Oh, holy God, it can't be. But Leon, it's all right. I love you. He leaned over and kissed her gently. Then he lay back in his arms behind his head, staring into the semi-darkness. She was very still. He reached out for a cigarette and offered her one. She refused and watched him silently, miserably. He inhaled deeply and said, Anne, you must believe me. I never would have touched you if I had thought. She jumped out of bed, dashed to the bathroom, and slammed the door. She buried her face in a towel to muffle her sobs. He followed her instantly and pushed open the door. Don't cry, my darling. Everything is still intact. You're still a virgin. I'm not crying because of that. Then what is it? You don't want me. Oh, my dearest, he took her in his arms. Of course I want you. I want you desperately, but I can't. You see, I've never dreamed. Uh, he, the faint show of anger burned, their te burned her uh, tears. What did you expect? I'm not a tramp. Of course you're not. I just assumed that somewhere along the line in college, to certainly Alan. Alan never touched me, so it would seem. Does it make so much difference to you, my being a virgin? All the difference in the world. I'm sorry. She heard her own words. With utter disbelief, the entire situation was insane. Hey, here they were, standing naked in the bathroom under the ugly, unshaded light, arguing about something that should be sacred. She grabbed a towel and covered herself. Please get out let me dress. I never thought I'd have to apologize for being inexperienced. I thought the man I loved would be pleased. Her voice broke and she turned her head to hide fresh tears of humiliation. With a quick gesture, he swept her up and carried her into the bedroom. He is pleased, he whispered, just overcome and handling it all like a blundering idiot. He placed her gently on the bed and lay down beside her. I'll try to be gentle, he said softly, and if you find you don't want to go through with it, just tell me. I want to, she said. She buried her head in his neck. Her voice was muscled, muffled. I love you, Leon. I want to make you happy, but it must work both ways, and this may not be easy for you. The first time really is. I understand. Don't you know? I mean, haven't you ever had a virgin before? Never, he admitted with a smile. So you see, I'm just as nervous about this as you. Just love me, Leon. Belong to me. That's all I asked. She clung to him. She didn't care about the hurt or discomfort. Just to belong to this wonderful man was the greatest happiness she could ever know. When the pain came, she clenched her teeth and made no sound. And when she felt his body go tense, she felt only surprised that he had drawn away from her. But he had groaned in satisfaction, and suddenly she understood, and her happiness doubled. At the height of his passion, he had thought to protect her. She leaned over and took him in her arms. His back was moist with perspiration. All at once she knew this was the ultimate in fulfillment, to please a man you loved. At that moment, she felt she was the, almost, she was the most important and powerful woman in the world. She, would, she was flooded with a new sense of pride in her sex. Later, he held her in his arms with a new tenderness. It wasn't much fun for you tonight, he said, but it will get better, I promise. Just promise to hold me close. 
Oh, Leanne, I love you so, and I adore you. I could spend the rest of the night telling you how wonderful you are. He stroked her hair, how beautiful you are. But I think we both should get some sleep. There's that 11 o'clock rehearsal tomorrow. Rehearsal? Well, that's why they call it. That's what they call it. You come along and tell me what you call it. He reached down and pulled up the sheet. Now let's both get some sleep. He held her gently and shut his eyes. Leanne, I can't sleep here. Why not? He sounded drowsy already. I don't know, in case Helen and Neely call in the morning. Forget about them. I want to find you in my arms when I wake up. She kissed his face, his brow, and his eyes. Then she slid out of his arms. We'll have that, Leon, many, many times, but not tonight. She went into the bathroom and dressed quickly. It wasn't because of Helen or Neely. It was just too much all at once. She wouldn't have slept a wink lying there beside him. And in the morning, well, things like this had to be taken in stages. Men were much more casual about it than women. But the most important thing in the world had happened. She knew the feeling of love. And she knew it was the whole reason for living. She came out of the bathroom and walked over to the bed. She started to speak, then saw that he had fallen asleep, smiling. She went to the desk, found a piece of hotel stationery, and scribbled, Good night, sleepy beauty. See you tomorrow. I love you. She propped the note by the phone and quietly slipped out of the room. In her own bed, she lay awake, too excited to sleep. Her mind relieved the entire evening, recalling every word he had said, every expression on his face. It will get better, I promise you. Would it? Would she ever shudder and tremble and stiffen with the ecstasy he had felt? It didn't matter. All that mattered was Leon to hold him in her arms, to please him, to know that she could feel love, that this remarkable man wanted her body against his. She drifted off into a soft, dark sleep. She was out of bed at nine. It was a clear, windy day. She looked out the window, saw a man walking against the wind, holding his hat, a girl waiting for a bus. She felt sorry for them. She felt sorry for anyone in the world because they couldn't feel as she did. Oh, you poor people. You think this is just another cold day? Look up at me. I want to tell you how happy I am. The whole world belongs to me. In this very building, there is a man, the most wonderful man in the world, and he belongs to me. The watery neon sign on the dinner on the diner seemed to blink at her. She winked back. It was a beautiful day, a beautiful diner, a beautiful town. She took a hot bath. When the water penetrated the soreness within her, it became a tangible memory of him. Her spirit soared. She took pains with her hair. She changed her lipstick twice, and she alternated in watching the clock and staring at the telephone. At 10.15, she began to feel uneasy. Did he mean to meet her at the theater? But he had said, we'll go together, or had he said, come along. When the phone rang, she dashed across the room. It was Neely. You could at least come to say hello to me after the show, she said. I thought you'd be at the party. Me, I'm regarded as chorus, and now I got a rehearsal. Is that the end, calling a rehearsal before a matinee? Poor me, poor Mel. He's beat. Where is he? Downstairs in the coffee shop. I'm meeting him there. Hey, life plant. Hi, how are you doing, lifestyle? I'll see you at rehearsal. Why should you come? It'll just be a drag. Neely, don't say a word, but there's a chance you may replace Terry King. You know her numbers, don't you? Know them, Neely squealed backwards. I know all of Helen's songs, too. Anne, are you kidding me? No, there's some plan. I sat in on a conference last night, but don't say a word. Just sit tight. Oh, golly, I can't believe it. Oh, I can't wait till I tell Mel. Bye. See you at the theater. 10.45, Leon hadn't called. Three times she had sta started for the phone to call him, but decided against it. She lit a cigarette and stood staring at the wintry sunlight from the window. The minutes ticked by. Somewhere a steeple bell chimed. Well, now what? Was she going to stand around in the room all day or go to the theater alone? No, that wouldn't look right. If he was there, he had called her. It would look as if she were running after him. Ridiculous. This wasn't Lawrenceville, and Leon wasn't a date wasn't just a date. There was no silly rules now. She marched resolutely to the phone and asked for his room. His voice was muffled at first, then he shot into the action. Good God, darling, it's really five of eleven. I thought I left a call for ten o'clock. I don't see how you could unless you woke up somewhere in the middle of the night. He laughed with his laugh was sheepish. I'm just reading your note. Boy, I'm a real Sir Galahand. Come on down and keep me company while I shave. You could almost hear him stretching over the phone. 
I'll order some coffee for us. The door was ajar and he yelled a cheerful come in to her light tap. He was standing in his shorts in the bathroom. He pulled her over and gave her a careful kiss, avoiding the leather on it, lather on his face. She then, uh, then he turned back to his shaving. His very casualness seemed to enhance the new intimacy between them as if it were the most natural thing in the world for her to be there. Watching him shave while he stood in his shorts, she sat on the rumpled bed, happier than she had ever been in her life. He washed the remaining lather off his face and came in. This time he leaned over and kissed her tenderly. Then he began the business of putting on his shirt. He whistled as he knotted his tie. Her happiness was making her feel weak. She had never known anything like it. She wondered why Leon felt the same, in, uh, wondered whether Leon felt the same in, intimacy. He couldn't. So many girls had probably seen him stand in his shorts while shave, shaving. She quickly pushed the thought from her mind. No girl had felt what she was feeling, and that made the difference. Nothing was going to ruin the most wonderful day of her life. The waiter knocked and wheeled in a table. Leon scribbled his name on the check, motioned to her to sit down, and gulped his orange juice standing. Then he carried his coffee to the phone and asked for Henry Bellamy's room. Henry was going to be late, too, Leon laughed. All right, coward, let's synchronize our watches. I have 11.30. Let's say we both walk in at 11.40. He hung up and turned to Anne with a grin. Think you can face the execution? I wouldn't miss it. What's going to happen? Nothing much. Just a few strong men will gang up on a little girl and force her to quit. You act like you've been through this before. I have. I can't be sloppy. It can be sloppy, even now. And then you run into Terry King, who turns out to be an embryonic Helen Lawson. You put a knife in her back, but she doesn't bleed. That's when you lose. They met Henry in the elevator. It was a surprise to see her with Leon. She showed no sign. He showed no sign. The entire cast, with the exception of Helen, was at the theater. The chorus girls sat in slacks or huddled in their fur coats, their dark glasses concealing the lack of eye makeup. They sipped coffee from paper cups and looked disgruntled. Neely sat at the edge of a chair, tense, waiting to spring. Anne sat in the fourth row with Henry and Leon. Jennifer North entered in in a rush, apologizing to everyone for oversleeping. The director turned from a huddle with the orchestra leader and nodded a good naturedly. Nothing's changed for you, Princess. If you like, you can go back to bed for a few hours. Jennifer smiled and came down into the darkened theater. Henry motioned her to sit beside them. He recognized Anne and smiled warmly. Isn't it wonderful? She said enthusiastically. We have a hit. I shouldn't say we. I do nothing. But it's such a great show. I'm thrilled to be in it. You're very lovely, Anne, Anne said sincerely. Thanks, but I don't think my name will bring any customers to the box office. Don't sell yourself short, said Henry. Once the show hits New York, you'll get plenty of newspaper space. I guarantee you a picture deal within six weeks of opening night. Jennifer dimpled. Oh, Henry, honestly, I adore it. Then a slight frown came between her eyes, but only if a big contract, not one of those starlet deals. Starlets often turn into stars, Henry said carefully. The frown grew deeper. Starlets with talent, I have no talent, Henry. That's why I need a good contract. If they pay you enough, they have to use you, and then they have to teach you and train you. Let me decide on that. It's If it's short money with a good studio, and I say take it, you take it. With the smell of television in the air, you're not handing out those big contracts so easy. Then perhaps I'm better off in New York. I've had offers from Powers and Longworth to model, and I could earn quite a bit with that, along with the show. Henry turned to her suddenly. Level with me, Jennifer. Do you want a picture deal or a career? I don't want to knock myself out of it if I don't really care. And what's with Tony Polar? How serious is it between you? Jennifer smiled. The newspapers blow it up. I adore Tony, but I don't think either of us wants to went rush into marriage. Besides, I'm still legally married to Prince Moralo. <laughs> The papers are practically signed for the annulment. Just remember the lines when you go before the judge. You're a nice Catholic girl and you want children and this bastard didn't want any. Are you Catholic, Leon asked. Jennifer shrugged. My mother was, but my father wasn't. They divorced. I was never even baptized. But no one will check, will they, Henry? Just do as I say. You're a Catholic. You wanted to be married by a priest, but the prince picked a civil ceremony. From then on, you're halfway home. Then you talk about the children you want it, Anne will be your witness. I what? Anne burst in. We have to have a witness, I mean, to tell you. 
I, I meant to tell you, don't worry, it will be a closed court. You have to say that you're a friend of Jennifer's and that she confided to you before she married this prince and how ecstatic she was about marrying the jerk, that she was even willing to go to Italy to live, and that she wanted dozens of children, but sure and remember the children part. But I'd be lying under oath, Anne argued. Cross your fingers, Henry said, then turning his attention to the stage, he whispered, Hold your hat. Here we go. Terry King was standing in the center of the stage, staring at the director in complete disbelief. Cut the ballot, she yelled. Are you mad? Did you read the reviews? The show's running long, honey, and we have enough ballads. The director's voice was casual. So what? Cut some other ballad. You know damn well mine is the best song in the show. Those are my orders, he said wearily. Where's Gil Case? He's not here. He's busy with the writers. Bill, hey, Bill Towley. A thin young juvenile appeared. Bill, the love scene, you and Terry have us out. We're working on a new solo dance routine for you to go in its place. For Philly, instead of telling Terry how much you love her, you do a dance. I'll speed up the action. Bill nodded in delighted acceptance and disappeared. And what do I do while he does his dance? Sit in my dressing room, Terry shrieked. Do you realize if the love scene is cut and the ballad goes, it leaves me with two lines in the first act and a rhythm number in the second, and that's all? The rhythm number stays in, the director answered. But we're putting the chorus behind you. They'll do a dance to the second chorus. <clears throat> and what do I do? Instead of singing the second chorus, you'll go to stage left. You'll stand there. Then the light will go off you, and you'll slip off stage while the chorus takes over. <clears throat> That's what you think, she grabbed her coat and rushed off the stage and out the theater. Then the director went on giving cuts and blends, and as if nothing had happened, ten minutes later, Terry reappeared, armed with a small man who looked like a raccoon. The raccoon bristled down the aisle. Now, what's this all about, he demanded. The rector turned, turned and looked down. What's what about, he asked innocently. Listen, Leroy, the raccoon hollered. Don't you think your innocent girlish face is going to fool me? I know this routine. Helen's scared of Terry. Only this time, Terry has a little luck going for her. She's got the biggest hit in ballad and the biggest hit in ballad in the show. You can't tell me the boys are going to let Helen cut their best song from the show. Call them, Leon suggested. I have. They're in conference with Gil Case. Besides, you mean Case is willing to pay Terry 400 bucks just to do two lines and half a rhythm number? If she wants to remain and do that, I suppose he'll have to. Oh, so that's the bit? The equity dodge? You'd love her to quit. Then you could put someone else in the park for a chicken feed. But if you fire Terry, you'll have to pay her till next June, plus her replacement. No one's firing Terry King. You can't afford to. That's why you're trying to make her quit, the director sat on the edge of the stage and said with exaggerated patience. No one is trying to make Terry quit. We're not thinking in personalities now. We're looking at the show as a whole. As an agent, you're only thinking of your client. I don't blame you, Al. That's your business, but my business is to think of the show. If it runs too long, I'm cutting where Gil Case, the writers, and all of us think it should be cut, regardless of who it affects. The raccoon stamped out a cigarette on the thick carpet of the theater. Don't give me that shit. You're following orders Case got from Helen Lawson. He has no choice. He has to protect old Ironsides. And with that brassy voice of her, she needs protection from a good singer. Let's not get personal about this, Leroy Snap. Why? You and I both know she dated. she's dated and corny. If that old bag was trying to get started today, she'd never get past the first audition. I think we can cut this out, Henry's voice shot out of darkness. The agent whirled around. I didn't see you, Mr. Bellamy. Hi. Say, look, it's nothing personal. I'm just fighting for my client the same way you probably did for Miss Lawson 20 years ago. I didn't fight for Helen by knocking a great star when she wasn't there to defend herself, Henry thundered. Who in hell are you, a weasel with a death space on, 50, on West 46th Street? How dare you stand there and insult one of the greatest living stars in the theater? The little man cringed. Mr. Bellamy, what would you do if you were in my place? It would depend on who my client was. If it was Helen Lawson, we would have handed in our notice and walked out with, her digni with, uh, with dignity. Because when with a Helen Lawson, even a Helen Lawson who just beginning, there would always be another show and a better part. 
but with your client, I'd take whatever crumbs were offered. I'd stay with two lines and half a chorus and milk the producer for the salary. So what if she's a joke to all the other producers at the Broadway opening? At her, It's her funeral, not yours. Maybe you'll find someone else after you bury her, but you'd better make her stick in the show and grab your lousy 10% because it's obviously you're scared. This may be the only show she'll ever get, and you're not about to pass up an easy buck. Terry King suddenly came to life. Listen, I can take take out sing. I can take out sing Helen Lawson anywhere. And Al and I aren't afraid. This lousy show isn't the only one. I'll bet I'm bigger star than Helen Lawson. I'll bet I walk out and with dignity right now. She's practically screaming. Hey, honey, wait, Al pleaded. This is exactly what they want you to do. And what do you want me to do? She snarled. Open in Philly and New York looking like a bit player. Just so you can collect your lousy 10%. That has nothing to do with it. You know that. We can make double this money playing clubs. But we both agreed that a Broadway show would get us the picture deal. Picture deal? That was Henry. God, that kind of thinking went out with Ruby Keeler movies. Any agent who thinks all you have to do is get on Broadway and it means a picture deal is, is small time. Sure, Broadway helps, but you've got to do something on Broadway. Unless your client wants a stock contract, I can get that for her without this show. But a real picture deal? No. Only a star gets that. And an agent builds a star by never allowing her to appeal anywhere unless she looks like a star, whether it's on Broadway or in a saloon. But as I say, you obviously don't think your client has it because you'll let her walk on looking like a bit player. Terry grabbed Al's arm. Come on, Al. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute, we still have a contract and you have a mat matinee to play, Al reminded her. I won't walk on stage with those cuts. I'm afraid you'll have to, Henry answered. You still have to hand in a week, two-week notice and play Philadelphia. I won't be humiliated like that, Terry insisted. I won't appear the f before the Philadelphia critics in a bit part. What's all the fuss about, Gil Case called as he walked down the aisle. Who's not going to appear? Mr. Case, Terry rushed to him almost in tears. You've cut my part. I can't appear on the stage as a bit player. I've told you she has to, Henry said slowly, even if she does hand in her notice right now. Now wait a minute, Gil said kindly. No one wants to hurt anyone more than necessary. He looked at Terry sympathetically. My dear child, I hadn't realized how small the part was after the cuts. It is hardly more than a bit now, he looked concerned. I can't play it, Terry was insistent. He suddenly smiled. You don't have to. What about the matinee, Henry asked. Gil waved his hand. Forget it. We can put all the uh, we can put on the understudy. The part's such a small bit, it really doesn't matter. He put his arm around Terry. Let's go back to my suite, you two. Al, Terry can write her formal notice, and I'll give her two months' salary as a bonus. He paused to consider. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll call my press agent and have him notify the New York papers, and you'll come out of this with tons of public publicity. Dear girl, by next week, every producer in town will be after you. It gives you stature to walk out on Helen Lawson's show. He led her up the aisle and out, to, out of the theater with the raccoon shuffling behind. The moment they were gone, Henry walked to the stage and had a quick consultation with the director. He nodded and sprang into action. Neely O'Hare, he called. Neely rushed up to him. Can you learn the one chorus of the rhythm number? By 2.30, I know both choruses now, he smiled faintly. Okay, we do the one chorus and we put in the dance. Come on, kids, we got work to do. Neely, you go to wardrobe, see how Terry's costumes fit you. Now, chorus, let's take it from the top. Henry stood up. Let's go, I think we all need some fresh air. Outside, they stood in embarrassment, embarrassed silence. I think I'll take a nap, Jennifer said. She walked away toward the hotel. Henry stood silently, staring into space. Leon pressed Anne's hand. I think it's revolting, Anne said. Then, forcing a faint smile, she said, but I suppose that's, how sh that's, that's show business. It's not show business, Henry snorted. It stinks. No matter how you slice it, it stinks. I want to vomit. I felt like Joe Lewis in a ring with two crumpled midgets. Jesus, well, I'll call Helen and tell her the good news. He walked slowly to the hotel. Leon led Anne across the street to the diner. He ordered eggs for both of them. Henry's wrong, he insisted. He scratched the kit kitten, and she scratched back. Hey there, good to see you. Thanks for showing up. And the agent is just the agent, not a Henry Bellamy. He's a champ. 
And then 20 years ago, he was a champ. And 20 years ago, if you'd scratch Helen Lawson, you'd have broken your fingers. Henry wasn't a louse. They just didn't have it. But they cut the ballad out, half the rhythm number. How could Terry fight back? What Henry said made sense. Leanna attacked his eggs. Do you honestly think that ballad would remain out? Once Terry's notice is signed and she's on the train back to New York, everything goes back as it was. If Terry had stuck, they'd have held off to the end of the end of the out of town run. Helen would have made everyone miserable, but everything would have gone back opening night, and Terry would have won. It's like a game of poker. Terry had the winning hand, but Henry bluffed her out of the pot. Fifteen minutes later, Henry joined them at the diner. He forced down a dry chicken sandwich, claiming his ulcers were acting up again. At 1.30, some of the chorus drifted over for a quick sandwich. They sat in little groups gossiping about the new, new, new events. Neely was the big news of the day. Anne decided against visiting Neely backstage before the matinee. Knowing Neely, she realized things must be chaotic. She stood with Leon at the back of the packed house during the performance. Neely managed the part with a professional ease. As far as Anne could see, she would neither hurt nor help the show. The part had been sliced to such proportions that it meant very little. Anne, I know you had something to do with it, Neely gasped when Anne went back to congratulate her. Helen told me about it today. Oh, Anne, I love you so much. You're really like a sister. Oh, this is, this is Mel. Anne toward, turned toward the young man who had been standing in a corner trying to look inconspicuous conspicuous. He darted forward, shook hands, and receded back against the wall. He was tall, too thin, and his alert dark eyes were, eyes were fixed on Neely with naked adoration. His warm, warmth hit Anne right away, and she was suddenly very glad for Neely. Wasn't, that, wasn't she sensational, Mel said proudly. Just wonderful, Anne said warmly. And next Monday in Philly, I get the ballad back in the love scene, Neely burbled. And Helen Lawson said she'll see to it I get a new set of costumes for New York. She thinks Terry's costumes are too sophisticated for me. Helen was enthusiastic about Neely. Wasn't your girlfriend just great? She shouted when Anne stopped by her room. Anne was, su Anne was surprised. Neely had been adequate, but Helen's enthusiasm was way overboard. She made that whore look sick, Anne continued. Neely's just what the part calls for. Nice, innocent kid. You watch when she sings the torch song on Monday. It'll really hit home. An innocent-looking kid torching gets to them. Anne started for the door. Hey, where the hell are you rushing to, Helen said, demanded. Leon Burke is waiting downstairs. Helen looked at her peculiarly. Listen, I saw you holding hands at the party last, last night. If you want to ball it up in New Haven, okay, but just remember that hunk of ice on your finger is the real thing. I'm giving it back. What? Helen shouted. Listen, Annie, for God's sake, you go on taking one night stand seriously. Anne turned away. Helen softened immediately. Look, Angel, you're young. I know how it is. And Leon is a real hunk of a man. Have a ball. You only live once. But don't give up Alan for a quickie romance. Anne smiled weakly and started for the door. You're going back to New York now, Helen asked. I think so. We're going to, going to Philly tomorrow morning and rehearse. Put back the ballad, tighten a few things up. I think by Monday night we'll have a real slick show, and your girlfriend will have herself a good part. I already told Gil Case not to look for anyone else for New York. I'm satisfied with Neely. Good luck on Monday, Anne said lamely. I'll see you then when you come in with Gino and Alan. Remember, we have a big date after the show. Alan, the opening, Gino. See, see you then, Helen called gaily. Leon was waiting outside. Paid all your duty calls, she nodded. He slipped her arm under his. I've gotten us, pa gotten us a pass, he said. We can take the next train back. I was afraid we might have to stick around, but Henry is remaining. He'll go on to Philadelphia, and we'll meet him there on Monday. She felt a sudden surge of exuberance at Leon's easy assumption that she was quite naturally with him from now on. But her spirit sank again at the thought of facing an inevitable without facing the inevitable with Alan. For the first time in her life, she understood the value of dear John, a dear John letter. How simple it would be if she could just drop him a note and say, "Dear Alan, enclosed find ten carat diamond ring. I think you're awfully nice, but I'm in love with someone else." It happened to her in her long separation of forty-eight hours. 
They had dinner on the train and without discussion went directly to Leon's apartment. She felt a slight shudder when she entered. The apartment seemed almost familiar to her. As if reading her thoughts, Leon said, This really is your apartment. I've always thought of it that way. You mean you actually thought of me before? He took her in his arms. And do you think I suddenly saw you for the first time in New Haven? I don't know. I've never occurred to me that you were ever aware of me. Well, I can't seem to recall you leering at me either, he said. I think I loved you all along. He, she said, I just wouldn't admit it. Not even to myself. I think all the wasted time... That's your fault. After all, what is a girl supposed to do? She can't walk up to a man and say, hey, by the way, though we've just met, I think you're the man I've been waiting for. I think it's a marvelous idea, believe me. The first girl who does that sort of thing will certainly make an impression, especially if she looks like you. Now you settle down on the couch and I'll fix us a drink. I'm going to give you a light scotch. It will help you relax. Do I seem jittery? He handed her the drink. Not a bit, but you must be feeling some nerves. Everything is so new. I'm new. Sex is new. He sat beside her and stroked her hair gently. She snuggled against him. I feel closer to you than I've ever felt to anyone in my life. I want to know everything about you. I don't want us to have any secrets. We're one, Leon, part one, part one of one another. I belong to you. He moved away and sipped his drink thoughtfully. I wonder if I can measure up to that kind of love, Anne. I don't want to hurt you. You couldn't hurt me, Leon. You've given me so much already. If nothing more ever happened ever after today, I'd still be grateful for the two most wonderful days of my life. He smiled gently. Then he took her hand and patted the finger with the large ring. Aren't we forgetting something? That's over. I'm returning the ring. And the way I feel about you, it's very real. I want you to know that. But I'll, but I've given all I might ever be able to give you, I, and it's enough. It's all I want, your love. I don't love Alan. I never have. I never really intended to marry him. It just so happened, so fast, and I was carried along. But even if you hadn't, even if it hadn't happened, I could never have gone through with it. I'd like to believe you, Anne. My conscience would be easier. Your conscience, Leon. Don't you love me? He looked into space as if searching for an answer. He saw the quick tears spring into her eyes, and he grabbed her shoulders. Yes, yes, I do love you. I love you, and I want you, but your kind of love frightens me, and I wonder if my love will be enough for you. She closed her eyes in relief. Oh, Leon, you searched me. Of course you can't love me like I love you. I don't expect it. No one can love anyone that much. She looked at him closely. Just love me, that's all I asked. Love me as much as you can, and let me love you. Oh my goodness. Well, we'll stop there for today. That is just, oh my goodness. So she lost her virginity today. Wow. This is it. Ah, that is crazy. That's so crazy. And this was written in a time when having the one night stand was probably really frowned upon but this is a product placement I did before but I'm unproduct placing it don't buy it it's not worth it maybe if it was only a dollar it would be worth it but it's not worth the six dollars and fifty cents sometimes you win sometimes you lose and this I bought today at legal this is a, a storage chest I needed something that I could put all the YouTube props and bells and whistles that I have. I needed it to put somewhere, and this was at Lidl, and I walked past it, and I walked past it several times, and I and I thought, well, that'll probably sell out, because sometimes they'll have an item that seems so incredibly practical, but then it sells out. But it was still there today after about a week. And I said, yeah, I'll just buy it. It's only $40 because I really do need something to keep a little bit more organized. I don't like a lot of furniture, but this is just fine. It's not too big. It's not too small. I'm going to end up using it as the footstool for the sofa. And then it holds all the YouTube stuff. And it's very inconspicuous because it's gray. It really doesn't stand out. I, I don't. I like very minimal and um, very modern types of furniture. So that sort of fit the mold more than what I'd seen at 
the furniture stores and stuff that I go to that it's just treachery to go to a furniture store. Can you relate? Yeah, for real. I hope you're having a wonderful day. It's Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. And I love you all so very much. And let me know that you were here so I can go and look at your channel, of course. And set you to moderator if you leave something in the chat. And have a wonderful evening. I hope all your Valentine's dreams come true. And romance is in the air. All right, give me a kiss. All right, have a good evening.